metapolemic. On the foundations of European dialectics in polemics and rhythmics. Quoting the preface to Adorno's Negative Dialectics. As far as he is able, the author lays his cards on the table. That is in no way the same thing as the game. Quoting Pascal's Penzais. All kinds of good principles have currency in the world. We simply neglect to put them into practice. Dialectics derives from a polemical tradition that has its beginnings in the Greek philosophers and the generations before Socrates. In sophistry and art of disputation and logical rhetoric for overwhelming the opponent arose for the first time, in a way in which it has scarcely again come to life in our civilization except in the age of the scholastics when, likewise, a seasoned art of disputation flourished. If, therefore, dialectician is supposed to be the name for someone who performs above average in the art of being in the right, philosophy, but also political reality, would have one problem less. Dialectics would then be only a prettier word for rhetoric and sophistry in the, neg in the negative sense for cavilling and the unscrupulous use of logic and language for the purpose of subduing by surprise. To be sure, many people, philosophers as well as non-philosophers, must have experienced dialectics or something that called itself such in some such way, for from many a despiser of sophistry and antiquity, to Schopenhauer, who declared Hegel to be a crazy charlatan, up to modern analytic philosophy, according to which dialecticians do not know in the strict sense what they are saying, and further to refugees from the Eastern Bloc, in which a so-called dialectical materialism is the ideology of the state. An endless series of voices have spoken out as victims, adversaries and critics of dialectics. If, therefore, it is supposed to be a mere art for always being in the right, there must be reasons why some remain immune to this way of maintaining that one is in the right. If it is only an art of convincing, it cannot be compelling, because too many people remain unconvinced, and that since time immemorial. If dialecticians are those who try to force affirmation of their truth, then innumerable people have resisted this attempt by counterposing their negation to it in an unmistakable way. The situation presents itself thus for a superficial consideration. This consideration is superficial because it is not concerned about contents, but holds firm only to the formal aspect. Here, on the one hand, there are thinkers who put their trust in a certain technique of arguing that in the end is supposed to always bring the truth to light. On the other hand, there are thinkers on whom this technique does not work in the sense intended by the dialecticians, and who obviously have a counterposed art at their disp disposal. This immunizes them against dialectical seduction. If we call the art of the dialectician dialectical logic, and the art of those who resist it or even repudiate it analytic logic, we have roughly described the confrontation that for ages has caused two rival philosophical styles to grate on each other. This finding, however, is no longer so completely superficial. The surface contains once again the thing itself. There is obviously a dispute about dialectics in which two rival schools, dialecticians, or anti-analyticians, and analyticians, or anti-dialecticians, struggle. And this seems to correspond precisely to assertions made by the dialectical position. If, out of the struggle between the two schools, the truth were to be produced, that would be ipso facto a result, one out of the dispute of opinions. However, dialectics, even if it receives gratification through this observation, must not want to go so far as to claim a complete victory or an exclusive justification vis-a-vis -vis analysis, because otherwise it would not have required any dispute from the beginning without contradiction, would have been able to say of itself, how things are. Thus, 
in the truth produced in the dispute between dialectics and analytics, analysis must have properly come into its own. If analysis had been totally defeated, dialectics would be in the wrong. Conversely, analysis too cannot win a total victory because it cannot disqualify dialectics from competence in matters concerning dispute. Thus, if in the dispute between dialectics and analysis, in accordance with the well-known three steps, as synthesis, a higher truth should emerge that sublates, aufhebt, the elements of truth of the one side, as well as those of the other. This higher truth must have overcome those aspects of the dialectic that have long since obviously provoked the uprising of a counterposition. Consequently, there is a false element, moment, in dialectics as soon as it coagulates to a position that is defended. Otherwise, the continual polemic of analysis against dialectics would not be possible. The nature of this false moment in dialectics is basically the only philosophical problem that remains of the legacy of dialectics once the misunderstandings are taken away. The question is thus, what is wrong with dialectics? Why must this doctrine for argumentation be disputed? Why is there so much resistance against a theory that, we could say highly realistically, treats experiences such as conflict, contradiction, history, development, becoming? Is not the opening up of such themes in any case an indispensable gain for philosophy that, once acquired, can provide a measure for every serious competing theory? Is it not to be seen as an advantage when a theory of the real comes so far as to not only dispute with other theories about truth, but also to conceive of the dispute as such, as an unavoidable presupposition of the search for truth? However, precisely here, the dilemma of dialectics begins. The analytic reply will say, Oh, you are talking of dispute well and good, but what is meant by that? Your dialectics means the art of conducting an intellectual dispute and grows out of the experience that in fact, from energetically antithetical discussion, insights are sometimes worked out that lie higher than the theses brought into the dialogue by the discussants at the beginning. If that is what is meant, we are all dialecticians, at least with regard to those things about which one can dispute at all. But in fact, you dialecticians mean something much more ambitious than a doctrine of productive dialogue. It is not simply that you want to talk about how we, as pugnacious theoreticians, work toward better insights through the levelling out of our extreme opposing opinions. The dialectical stimulus indeed begins only where we try to speak of the dispute and contradiction of things in reality and as reality. The ground under our feet gets hot when dialectics is understood, not as dialogics, but as ontology. But where does the boundary run? The disputatious dialogue is not only an imaginary opposition of two statements that meet in a logical space, but if the contradictory statements are to work with each other, it will be first and simultaneously necessary for us, you and me, to duel bodily and to use our opinions against each other like sharpened weapons. The antithetical nature of the statements alone does not instigate enmity. Subjects must be found who truly struggle against each other with these statements in reality, with personal presence and psychosomatic intensity. The dispute, although it brings statements into battle against statements, thus does not belong merely to the intellectual sphere, but itself signifies a piece of reality. And with this, the dilemma of dialectics begins. Those who begin to reflect on the dispute of ideas inevitably come to a point where the logical passes over, whatever that may mean, into the ontological. In the dispute, a contradiction is not only thought, but staged in reality. With this, dialectics has set foot in ontology. Hence analysis can no longer slam the door shut in its face. Dialectics has put its foot too firmly in the way. Disputatious processes are indeed part of what really exists. And the logic of productive dispute unmistakably reaches over into the ontological domain. 
here something takes place that we can call the ontological putsch of dialectics, because it is now undeniably penetrated into the ontological domain. It tries, with a bold and arbitrary stroke, to take possession of the entire realm of the existing as its domain. With this it turns the cosmos into an all-encompassing dialectical process, as if it were nothing other than a disputatious phenomenon that unrelentingly propels itself through its own dramatic, agonistic self-movement. Hegel developed this view with an almost devastating consistency and brilliant radicality with regard to almost all phenomena of being. For him, world history is a bloody, seething dispute of the Weltgeist that ultimately culminates in radiant self-knowledge of self-knowledge. This dispute strives, through a powerful chain of self-sunderings and self-surmountings, in search of the concept of itself, toward the moment when it, in Hegel, no longer only seeks, but has found, no longer moves forward, but flows into the fulfilled moment of absolute knowledge. Here, dialectics has left completely from a doctrine of dialogue over into a doctrine of the world, from a logic over into an ontology, and how all dominating the dialectical principle has thereby become, is revealed in Hegel's intrepid undertaking to erect anew from first principles and in the spirit of dialectics, even the science of logic. With this ontological inflation of dialectics to the greatest system construct in the history of European philosophy, a point has been reached from which a backlash became unavoidable. The fates of the Hegelian system, which meanwhile from our distance appears as a ghostly ruin of idealist metaphysics, indicate the inevitable turning point clearly enough. Even Hegel's unprecedented dialectical system did not elude the fate of being reduced and turned to a mere position against which powerful and successful oppositions consolidated. What had claimed to be the whole fell back into the position of a moment a mere pole of an antagonism. Against the pretensions of self-glorying speculation, a solid and modest spirit of empiricism awoke to an energetic self-consciousness. Against the idealism that has been driven to an extreme, the materialist reaction arose. Against the grandiosity that had become a system, an existential consciousness articulated itself that provided an account of our relativity and fragility, and above all against the hegemony of theory, a current now made headway that resolutely prescribed for itself the primacy of praxis. For if Hegel reached a point in his grand view of above the world historical processes, where the spirit thinks it has come to rest in the unity of reason with reality, the post-Hegelian generations have known and felt nothing more sharply than the reality in the post-Hegelian generations have known and felt nothing more sharply than that reality and reason blatantly diverge, and that if the gap were ever to be closed, this would have to be a matter of a praxis that transforms reality and makes it accord with reason. The five-fold antithesis to the system of dialectics, empiricism, materialism, existentialism, primacy of practice, reason as not yet, characterises down to the present the situation with which every later philosophical, philosophical theory, whether it be dialectical or analytic, had to debate or come to terms. However, from then on, mere anti-dialectical convictions are even more inadequate to the task, for whatever may come after and against Hegel, it will, whether it wants to or not, fall into the dialectic of dialectics. In other words, into the conflict of subjective reason with the collapsed system that had wanted to, make, wanted to demonstrate an all-pervading objective reason of conflict. This conflict begins with a blunt refusal to make dialectics absolute. The dream of a productive contradiction that everywhere moves through thesis and antithesis to higher syntheses cannot be pursued. Real being, precisely when it is viewed in its movements, 
developments and struggles cannot be, cannot be thought of as, according to the model, an enormous disputatious dialogue that strives through all extremes towards truth. If we say no to this, we demand nothing other than that dialectics be forced back out of ontology. A complete expulsion is inadmissible because, as we have said, a disputable theory of dispute is itself already a foot in the door. After Hegel, it must accordingly be the concern of philosophy to reverse the ontological putsch of dialectics without suppressing the scope of its validity. This demands nothing more or less than a rational, analytic construction of dialectics in the form of a universal polemics. The point in which the dialectical tradition was great, that is, to disputatiously think the dispute, to think the contradiction and the movements of contradiction, that must be sublated by a rational theory of dispute. Of course, this sublation, measured against Hegel's claim, is a sinking and positively grounding erdung, a realistic and illuminating anchoring of this universal polemics in universally understandable arguments. Quote, when two people quarrel, the third is glad. End quote. Through an interpretive unfolding of this saying, the polemical meaning of dialectics can be grasped. In the struggle with each other, the first and second parties consume their powers when they are approximately the equal of the other, so that an additional third party could subjugate both with little trouble. In the dialectical dialogue, however, we find no third party, but rather only two partners who as far as possible work with each other. If both do their job equally well, we can predict that the match will be undecided. If both are skilled polemicists, it will not be impossible for them not only to defend a position that has been thought through and worked out, but even to make an offensive advance against the adversary. However, the picture is suddenly altered when the first party not only goes to battle as a competent polemicist, but tries to be polemicus and arbiter simultaneously. That is precisely the dialectician. As such, the latter leaps out of the position of the partner with equal status into that of the superior third party, and then in its double role as first and third party, quashes the position of the second. It disputes with cleverness against cleverness, but takes care to remain the cleverer one. It takes up, as we say, the moments of truth in the opposing side, subordinates them, and adopts them from a higher level as its own. This, however, is legitimate only when the second party in turn declares itself not simply to be outdone, but to be convinced by the third. Thus the third party, by its ascent, again comes closer to the opponent with whom, on a common higher level, it would have reached agreement. We would then have two third parties, both of whom would be glad about the dispute between the first and the second, because both would have come out of it winners. But that means, metaphorically speaking, if the dispute between two, there is no third party, for as long as they maintain a balance, we cannot talk of dialectics, but have to always call the manner by the appropriate name, dialogue, or disputatious conversation. The poverty of dialectics is concentrated in the often conjured up function of synthesis. In the conflict of forces according to dialectics, the newer and higher entity will be born. However, a trick lurks in this acknowledgement of the conflict, for this acknowledgement is made only by the party who regards itself as the victor in the dispute, not by the loser. It could be that our European dialectics since Heraclitus have all been victors' fantasies that try to conclude something like a peace treaty in the so-called synthesis. To be sure, it is a kind of dictated peace in which the loser is supposed to come to terms with and be assimilated into the new order. In the jargon of dialectics, this means that a universal will and let me try that again. In the jargon of dialectics, this means that a universal will be erected over an antagonism. 
what really happens thereby is the reinterpretation of polemics as dialectics, that is, the summarising of a dispute by the victor. The latter models the history of the struggle as the development and progress towards its own person. The consciousness of the conquered party no longer speaks explicitly in the victor's resume, but only as a subordinated moment. Its contribution is sublated, it itself remains below. The victor is thus, viewed structurally, a double ego, namely first and third, and in the function of the third it swallows up to a certain extent the arguments, powers and rights of the second. Hegel's Weltgeist operates like a cannibal who devours opposed consciousness and gains its sovereignty by digesting them. This positive dialectic functions as the suppression of a second party. Indeed, precisely speaking, it functions as the second subjugation of what had already once opposed the first. For the second position, the antithesis, emerges in reality not as a dueling partner of equal status, or as the other extreme, but as a revolt against an already established hegemonic power. The positive dialectic thus does not leave the realm of polemics, but ends the dispute with a victor's dictate. With this it always intervenes in a polemical happening, and as a rule on the side of the hegemonic power and ruling consciousness. It reinforces the above-below, good-evil, ego-id structures from the viewpoint of the dominant position at the expense of the underdog. With this comes a pronouncedly ironical result. Positive dialectics from Plato to Lenin, in practice, function as obstacles to, and falsifications of what they have taken as their topic, the productive dispute and the equalising of forces. It is on this experience that Adorno's bold inversion of the tradition of dialectics is based. This inversion mistrusts the victor ideology of the higher synthesis. In reality, the victories of the universal do not bring any relaxation of tensions. The negation remains just as unproductive as the negation of the negation. The sublations are a lie. Nothing better comes afterward. The more dialectical parties, blocks, ideologies, raise themselves against each other, the more the spirit of deadlock, control and rigidification triumph so under cover of hectic production and armament. Living things increasingly become weapons and tools. To the extent that, directly or indirectly, everything becomes struggle and business, war and exchange, weapon and commodity, the living element, for whose development and enhancement, according to the conception of dialectics, conflict is beneficial, dies. In the end, the dialectics is no longer even seemingly the form of movement of reason in historical conflicts. But if we think of Stalin's use of dialectics, it becomes an instrument of artful, calculating paranoia. War is not at all the father of all things, but rather the obstructor and annihilator. Adorno's correction of dialectical theory is consistent in taking its starting point in the dubious synthesis. Quoting from Negative Dialectics, Frankfurt, 1966, page 7. The formulation, negative dialectics, offends against tradition. As early as Plato, dialectics wants to create something positive with the means of thinking called negation. The figure of a negation of the negation later designated this concisely. The book wants to liberate dialectics from this sort of affirmative essence. Negatively conceived dialectics works towards a universal polemics without saying so. If the first party is the idealism of the hegemonic powers, and the second is the materialism of the oppressed, then the third, which emerges from the dispute, is basically the first again, but worse. The erection of a universal over antagonisms always leads to the same thing. Certainly something moves in doing this, but plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. I don't speak French. Okay, Adorno's negative turn against traditional dialectics amounts to a denial of what in today's predominant dialectical doctrine, Marxism-Leninism, is a mere lie. 
However powerful and productive his realistic side may be, he has indeed has all the themes of the aforementioned fivefold antithesis to Hegel, that is, everything that today we call realistic. The existential moment, however, only in a mutilated form. Adorno was not realistic enough in a decisive point. He did not bring about the withdrawal of dialectics from ontology in a satisfying, rationally well-ordered form. I'll read that sentence again without the parenthesis. However powerful and productive his realistic side may be, Adorno was not realistic enough in a decisive point. He did not bring about the withdrawal of dialectics from ontology in a satisfying, rationally well-ordered form. This withdrawal, we maintain, must lead to a universal polemics that penetrates the dispute in its social dynamics and evolutionary function. A theory that, after Hegel wants to call itself dialectical, has to achieve this nothing more or less. Marx made a start with this. He presented a history of philosophy that makes sense only when it is understood as a first attempt at a rational, universal polemics. The central idea of his theory, that all previous human history is a history of class struggles, shown as Marx's attempt to liberate dialectics from its idealistic inheritance, and to ground it realistically and empirically as a theory of reality, that is, as universal polemics. Nevertheless, the dilemma of dialectics was repeated in Marx himself. He provided not only a universal polemics, but within this also a false proof as to why his position had to be the victorious one. Marx too produced a victor's fantasy in advance. That is, he falsified polemics again into dialectics. The expropriation of the expropriators is meant to establish something universal over the antagonism between the exploited and the exploiters, namely the just distribution of wealth. The means for doing this, however, are not universal, but a new polemic, the oppression of the oppressor, the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat. Marx's thinking, itself dictatorial, affirms this dictatorship. For Marx too, dialectics serves as a positive artificial means, party and arbiter, first and third at the same time. However realistic Marx was as an inaugurator of a universal polemics, he remained unrealistic with regard to the aims and results of the struggles he postulated. What today we encounter as so-called one-party systems are the malformed offspring of this truncated rationalism. Parties that have gone so far in the victor's fantasy that they believe they have now integrated the second position and sublated it into the one unique higher synthesis. The party as the whole, the pole as integral, the moment as totality. Precisely that is the schema in which, in Marx's own words, the whole shit has to start all over again. What began as an attempt to avoid the dualistic danger of paranoia by means of a dialectical acknowledgement of the one as well as the other, in the last moment becomes a new one-sidedness that forces new dualisms. Marx's attempt to ground our rational universal polemics must be regarded as having failed, in reality just as much as in theory. His lasting achievement lies in the attempt itself. Our only choice is to rationally carry on his attempt. Human history is really also a history of struggles, as Marx emphasised. But whether he was right in identifying all historical struggles as class struggles is more than questionable. The world polemics we see before us as world history reveals, rather than the image of an enormous inter-ethnic, international and inter-imperial conflicts. Um, I think I said that wrong. The world polemics we see before us as world history reveals, rather than the image of enormous inter-ethnic, international and inter-imperial conflicts, crisscross and overlaid of course by the fact that the subjects of conflict in themselves are mostly class societies, at least in the historical period we identify in general with the history of the state, i.e. hierarchical societies of domination. 
However, no sophistry will ever be in a position to present the human history of war in such a way that it corresponds completely to the history of class struggles. Class society too is just as much a product of war as war is the product of class society. Here, the historical facts count, and the conflict between fact and theory, we will always have to say, going against Hegel, all the worse for the theory. War is older than class society, and struggles between class societies are not class struggles per se. A universal polemics, in contrast to Marx, enjoys the advantage of being able to afford these clear distinctions from the beginning. It can do this because it does not want to be a victor's fantasy, and has no interest in proving the necessary and historically due triumph of one party. Even less is it compelled to construe subjects of conflict that cannot be found, as Marxism did when it postulated a militant proletariat as the world historical conflictual partner of the bourgeoisie. Universal polemics can even go a step further in historical description than historical materialism. Namely, it can investigate the polemical style of the dialectician as one of the most important phenomena in the modern history of conflict. It shows what happens when a party founds its struggles on a dialectical theory. Positive dialectics, for its part, remains an object for universal polemics. Adorno's great intervention relates to this point. Only a negative dialectics would cease to be the legitimating ideology of a party that dreams of itself as victor and as the whole. Only with this can misuse of dialectics cease. If its rational core has been laid bare as universal polemics, its lying side can and must disappear. Then it will no longer perform dogmatic services for anyone. It will no longer be a weapon an ideology, an instrument of propaganda, but will become what it has falsely understood itself to be. But will become what it falsely understood itself to be, an instrument for the description of reality, history and the conflicts of consciousness. When Adorno, as he said, put his cards openly on the table, he executed the gesture that had long since been due in the overripe tradition of dialectics. As negative dialectics, it openly gives up the attempt to compulsively be in the right and to celebrate the force of the victor as a higher synthesis. Critical theory was the attempt to come into the inheritance of dialectics without spinning victor's fantasies. In it, the legacy of those who have been violated and beaten down gains expression. It raises for the first time in a consistent way the demand that human history be written that the unhappy ones who perished as victims appear not simply as dung, and that historiography not repeat the violence and injustice that happened in past struggles through its mode of examining. And for an expansion of the dung comment, see chapter 7, section on the Grand Inquisitor. Is that all? Can we be satisfied as soon as dialectics has been turned back out of ontology into the domain of universal polemics? Is its rational core constituted only by this polemics? Was everything else only fine phrases and arrogance? It remains to be shown that what we call dialectics has a second root that remains firmly anchored even when we have to pull out the first. We find the second root when we listen a little to the ontological and natural philosophical claims of dialectics. Sooner or later in the self-presentation of dialectics, the assertion is inevitably made that it is the science of becoming, and that becoming in turn is the great law of reality. And then without fail, soon after comes the touchingly naive example of the plant that becomes a seedling out of a seed, whereby the seed disappears and transforms itself into the plant that it gives forth. The latter in turn provides the seed which leaves the plant, is carried away and germinates anew, while the old plant dies, just as waning is in general the adverse side of becoming. Have we not, without noticing it, changed over from social polemics to natural philosophy and biology? To be sure we have changed terrain, but not without noticing it, for the so-called 
dialectics of nature that has always been the Achilles heel of this line of thinking. Especially since Hegel, we can amuse ourselves with certain assertions. The flower is the antithesis of the bud, whereas the, quote, quoting the phenomenology of spirit, fruit now declares the flower to be a false experience of the plant. Conceptual sorcery? Rhetorical hyperbole? Hyperbole? Analysis really does not have a hard job here of demonstrating a misuse of language. The mockery of the critics lies to hand and is justified. However, it should not make us blind to the significant idea provided by the example. Naive as it sounds, it hints at a naive and original fundamental layer of philosophizing that cannot be completely dissolved by any dialectical or analytic artfulness, no matter how sophisticated. For this example is looking at the cycle of life and the great and universal transformation of appearances between becoming, existence and waning. The old tradition of wisdom, the pre-scientific tradition, has these phenomena constantly in mind. It sees the changes of seasons, the rhythm of day and night, the recurrence of waking and sleeping, the in and out of breathing, the alternation of light and shade. In the centre of these polar phenomena it finds the play of the sexes, which at the same time provides the model for the expansion of the polar dyads into the dialectical triad. For in the encounter of the masculine and the feminine, the child emerges. The synthesis of father and mother, egg and sperm, love and law, and so on. I think that these naive observations show what dialectics tried to base itself on in its positive aspect. Namely, for a long time, it borrowed its ontological principles from an original philosophy of life that had the play of antagonistic world forces and dualities in mind. <coughs> what calls itself dialectics is in reality a rhythmics, or a philosophy of polarity. Through pure observation it tries to grasp life and the cosmos of the untiring change of phases and states of being in their coming and going, such as ebb and flow, the cycles of the stars, joy and sadness, life and death. The great rhythmics understands all phenomena without exception as pulsations, phases, cadences. It recognises in them the to and fro of the one, of the cosmic principle in its natural and unavoidable turnings, that everything in the world has its counterpart, that circumstances move in an eternal flow and cycle, and that the extremes transform themselves into each other. These are the great unshakable visions this rhythmics achieves. The dialectic of Heraclitus, the first and probably also the only European dialectic that is a pure philosophy of polarity, without becoming a polemic, therefore also contemplative and mysterious, not wanting to convince, and not intended for the disputatious dialogue, corresponds completely to this type of wisdom. Here Sloterdijk provides a selection of quotations from Antike Geisteswelt, Eine Sammlung klassischer Texte, by W. Ruig. Frankfurt, 1980, pages 92 to 93. Opposites strive for unity. From variety arises the most beautiful harmony, and everything arises on the basis of discord. Connection. Whole and not whole. Convergent striving and divergent striving. Ringing in unison and ringing differently. And from everything, one thing and from one thing everything. Both, and precisely that, is always in us, living and dead, the awake and the sleeping, and young and old. The one is transformed into the other, and in the new change, the latter again becomes the former. We step, and do not step into the same rivers. We are, and we are not. Such a view of the world totality still possesses the coolness and greatness of a first philosophy. It has a reflective, not an argumentative, meaning. 
It is taught for everybody and for nobody. Not persuading, at most giving hints. It could also be left completely unsaid, and under no circumstances does it want to be, quote-unquote, defended like an opinion or a position. Its speech is like an attuning to a rhythmic, pulsing cosmos. The world, after all, possesses its own gait and breathing, and this earliest philosophy of polarity was only an unresisting breathing with the in and out of the world. Between the world law of polarities and their understanding by the philosopher, there is no gap. Thinkers, or better, seers, do not assume their own position and do not distinguish themselves as knowing subjects from known phenomena. In the great world of these pulsations and polar transformations, they do not appear as egos that could separate themselves from this world and thereby fall into error. Everything they say also goes through them, and it would be so whether they said it or not. As a final consequence, we would have to call such a doctrine of polarity a philosophy without a subject. Wherever this view reigns, there are basically only the rhythms, only the to and fro of energies and opposed poles. For the separate ego of the human being, there remains no self-contained sphere. In relation to these rhythms, there is, for human beings, only one valid stance, Surrender. Understanding means to be in accord with. Those who see that the world is harmony and strife will not struggle against it. Wherever insight reigns, the subject of struggle has already faded. If, however, dialectics in this sense may really be called the highest theory, it seems to be argumentatively completely defenceless. In its free-floating contemplation, it has relaxed to the most serene of all unprovability. Such wisdom is thus in no way polemics, but rather attunement and rhythmization. If it is at all correct to say, call such philosophy of polarity dialectics, it is a matter in any case of a cosmological contemplative theory. In it there is nothing that reminds one of the more modern dialectical subject-object relation. With respect to the polarities, human beings do not have a contradiction of their own. Human beings do not face the polarities as a subject faces a thing. The individual human being can be at most a pole, subject among subjects, force among forces, inserted simultaneously, unresistingly and actively in whatever happens. It is not endowed with the characteristic of counterposing itself to hu- counterposing itself to being as the self-glorifying, autarkic other subject. This begins only when the human world has become autonomous, when the higher degrees of civilization and socialization, the polemical principle, becomes tense and heats up, when oppression, violence, enmity, domination, war, ideology, martial arts, strategy, etc., begin to form corresponding polemical subjects. These subjects undertake intensively the splitting off of the other pole and make of it an object. This corresponds roughly to the polemicization of the id treated earlier. We then are no longer concerned merely with rhythms and polar oppositions, but with military, political, social, ideological animosities. The principle of enmity encroaches on the formerly neutral poles. The force-force relation becomes ego-id, subject-object. From now on, the respective negative should no longer even show its face. In the polemics, the backlash of the other side should be put out of action. Thereby, however, the world of rhythmics is destroyed. Polemical dialectics, to be sure, tries to preserve a residue of polarity by emphasising that the transit through the opposite pole is necessary. In fact, however, it affirms and carries on the polemics because it feels itself capable of a victory over the opposed principle. The reconciliations that dialectics thought out for itself were second dominations. And the syntheses in thought had the function of disarming the second party and subordinating it. 
Only in logic does negation of the negation sound neutral and just. Only in logic can it seem that the antithesis has received its due before the negation of the negation brings about a synthesis. In reality, it is a matter of preventive negation of the negation. In other words, the suffocation of the antithesis at its source. The antithesis does not unfold itself to an imposing pole, but remains a mere potential. A suffocated and sleeping negation. For this reason, Adorno's negative dialectics designates not a late degeneration, but a fundamental trait of dialectics. Negative dialectics recognises finally the dialectics of hindering. Hindering is the only ingredient that can be brought into the world of rhythms by the subjects. Wherever people's lives succeed, it happens not so much through combative self-insistence, but because they develop cultures in which rhythmical shapes can come into play without our interference. Creative life flourishes wherever we renounce our capacity to hinder. Thus there are surely no hindered geniuses, just geniuses at hindering. The quote-unquote subject, born of manifold hindering and threatening of itself, can only interfere everywhere as hinderer, combatant and producer of quote-unquote objects. In society, it arises out of the thousands of large and small restrictions, denials, definitions, enmities, inhibitions and alien regulations that merge into its identity. To attack the subject means to drive it all the more into itself. Identity was in quotes there as well. In exoteric form, we recognise this only since the total arming of modern political subjects has brought the global destruction of the world into practical reach. The apparently most simple abstraction, quote-unquote, struggle, to quote Marx, which expresses an ancient relation valid for all societies, end quote, is therefore practically true for us today for the first time. I'll read that again without the parenthesis. The apparently most simple abstraction, struggle, is therefore practically true for us today for the first time. Only at the peak of modernity does the identity of subjectivity and armament reveal itself to us. Only here do we have to do with struggle as such, struggle sans phrase. What the great esoteric doctrines of the world have carried through the millennia with mysterious exuberance as their dangerous secret now steps out into the light of a demystified reflection in which we can say serenely what our defensiveness means. Only in modernity has life frozen so much into the defense of subjects that our thinking, late but not in vain, can achieve the true universal concept for such subjectivity. How life could really be becomes more deeply forgotten day by day in the unfolded system of hindrances. We could only be helped by that which helps us to disarm as subjects, on every level, in every sense. However, insofar as the liquefaction of subjects, which was always the concern of inspired thinking, remains the decisive task of practical reason, philosophy too, as theory of reason, also gains with this its ultimate norm. A rationality that has offered its services to the hardening of subjects is already no longer rational. Reason that maintains us without extending us was not reason at all. Thus, mature rationality cannot elude dialectical becoming. In the end, the most rigorous thinking, as the mere thinking of a subject, must go beyond itself. It does not matter whether in this we bank on the self-reflection of a philosophy of consciousness, on the communicative action of a philosophy of language, meta-religiously on meditative fusion, or aesthetically on playful transcendence. A rational, that is a physiognomically sympathetic reason, will unconstrainedly intercept the decision from the inclinations of our bodies. does not matter whether in this we bank on the self-reflection of a philosophy of consciousness, on the communicative action of a philosophy of language, meta-religiously on meditative fusion, 
or aesthetically on playful transcendence. A rational, that is, physiognomically sympathetic reason, will unconstrainedly intercept the decision from the inclinations of our bodies.